Hey everyone, so this is my first video for civil law. And actually at first, no obligations and contracts before you start yung second sem. Um, I was very scared to take it because it's a five-unit subject and I didn't have it in my pre-law course because I was a Paul Sy graduate. So, walang obligon doon. So, insecure ako sobra. I was reading the whole break about what an obligation is, what the juridical necessity, ganyan. So, I hope this video helps those like me na nangapa talaga sobra dun sa start ng obligon. So, ayan. Uh, this presentation is based on the discussions of Attorney Judy Lardizabal and also from the books of Balane and Lincoln. So, okay, let's start. So, title one is Obligations. So, the first question is, what is an obligation? So, the law on obligation and contracts is a, is a kind of positive law which deals with the nature and sources of obligations as well as the rights and duties arising from agreements in contracts. It is important to everyone to know that in every obligation, there is a general principle on human relations. Yun yung nasa Article 19 ng Civil Code, which says that every person must, in the exercise of his rights and in the performance of his duties, act with justice, give everyone his due, and observe honesty and good faith. So, what is an obligation? It says in Article 1156 that an obligation is a juridical necessity to give, to do, or not to do. So when I first read this, parang ho, juridical necessity? So what is a juridical necessity? It is a need that arises from law. What makes an obligation is the power of the creditor to haul the debtor before the court to make the debtor perform. Obligation creates a liability which can be enforced. So the definition is incomplete because it views obligations only from the debt side and it's centric is um in the debt or or yung passive subject which will be discussed later so here it says na no demand no default and in the latter articles din yan ma discuss unless the creditor acts the debtor is not obliged to perform obligation to pay is a juridical necessity if the debtor does not pay he is in default so therefore yung performance is always mandatory it gives rise to the liability. So what are the essential elements of an obligation? So sabi ko kanina, passive subject yung debtor. So there are four. First is the passive subject or the debtor or the obliger. So this is the person who is bound for the fulfillment of the obligation. Siya yung may duty. Second is the active subject or the creditor or the obligee. This is the, per the person who is entitled to demand the fulfillment of the obligation. So, ito yung may karapatan. He has the right. Third is the object of prestation or the subject matter of the obligation. So, this is the conduct required to be observed by the debtor. So, merong tatlo to. Sabi kanina, di ba? Juridical necessity uh, is to give to or not to. So, first is to give. It's delivery of a thing to the creditor. So, in sale, deposit, pledge, donation. Then, we have to do. It covers all kinds of works or services. So, contracts, so profession, for professional services, ganyan. Then, we have not to do or consists of refraining from doing something. Tapos, lastly, we have the juridical or legal tie. It's also called, it's also called the efficient cause. It's the, the one which binds or connects the parties to the obligation. So the tie in an obligation can be easily determined by knowing the source of the obligation. So mamaya rin discuss yung mga sources ng obligations but there are a lot of sources and it can come from any of those which creates the juridical or legal tie. So next, what are the kinds of obligations? So meron tayong real obligation, personal obligation, then under personal obligations, there's positive and negative personal obligations. So first, what is a real obligation? So a real obligation is an obligation to give. It's that which the subject matter is a thing which the obliger must deliver to the obligee. So pwedeng determinate to, pwedeng indeterminate yung thing. Then we have personal obligation or obligation to do or not to do. It's that which the subject matter is an act to be done or not to be done. So, yung sinasabi ko ng two kinds is positive personal obligation or an obligation to do 
or to render service and a negative personal obligation or an obligation not to do, which naturally includes obli obligations not to give. So what are the various sources of obligations? So Article 1157 says that obligations arise from law, contracts, quasi-contracts, acts or omissions punishable by law, and quasi-beliefs. So first we have law. So you obligations arising from law are imposed by the law itself. It must be expressly or impliedly set forth and cannot be presumed. Tapos, we have contracts. Uh, these arise from stipulations of the parties, meeting of the minds. Uh, it's a formal agreement. It must be complied with in good faith because it is the law between the parties. Neither party may uh, unilaterally evade his obligation in the contract unless in authorized no contract or the other party assents. So under Article 1305, it says that a contract is a meeting of minds between two persons whereby one binds himself with respect, with respect to the other to give something or to render some service. So next we have quasi-contracts. Um, these arise from lawful, voluntary, and unilateral acts in which are enforceable to the end that no one shall be unjustly enriched or benefited at the expense of another. So may two kinds yung quasi-contracts. We have negotiorum gesture and um, solution in deputy. So yung first one, it's an authorized management. This takes place when a person voluntarily takes charge of another's abandoned business or property without the owner's authority. So for example, si, si A may ari ng bahay, kapit bahay niya si B. Si A nagpunta ng bagyo. Tapos yung bahay ni B suddenly nakita niya yung garden na susunog. So may so si si B gumawa ng paraan para ma maayos yung garden. So gumasto siya. So eto since yung since ginawa ni B yon, now um A is an oblig is an obligation na ibalik yung nagastos ni B ni A kay B. So this is under negotiorum gesture. While in solution and debity, it is the undue payment. This takes place when something is received when there is no right to demand it, and it was unduly delivered through mistake. So, ito yung um, akala mo magbabayad ka dun sa person, pero mali pala, mali pala yung amount na nabayad mo, or um, nabayaran na pala yun, yung ganun, or yung, kung mare, uh, sobrang sukli, ganyan. So, solution and debity. Then, we have the leaks, or the obligations um, that arise from crimes. So, these are the civil liability, which is the which is the conflict, which sorry, which is the consequence of a criminal offense, is also um, is also stated in the revised penal code. So Article one hundred of the revised penal code says that every person criminally liable for a felony is also civilly liable. So ayan yon. Then we have quasi delicts, or we also call this as torts. It's an obligation which arises from damage caused to another through an act of omission, there being no fault or negligence, but no contractual relation exists between the parties. Mamaya rin, mas discuss yan. So we have an example here to further um, elaborate on what we have already, for, on the terms we already discussed a while ago. Oh, sorry. So in January 2018, Mrs. A, a married woman, on her sixth month of pregnancy, was crossing a street when she was suddenly hit by a car, being reckless street driven by Mr. X. As a result, Ms. A sustained serious physical injuries and further suffered an unintentional abortion. Mrs. A was hospitalized for two months, during which she incurred 400,000 pesos in medical fees. Her expenses were all duly substantiated by official receipts. During the two-month period of her confinement, she was unable to report for work and earn any salary, which was established at the rate of 50000 per month. Mrs. A then filed a civil case for damages against Mr. X. So the question here is, based on the case filed by Mrs. A, what is the source of Mr. X's obligation to her as a result of his acts? So here, the source of Mr. X's obligation is from quasi-delict, as quasi-delicts are acts or omissions which causes damage to another in his person, property, or rights, giving rise to an obligation to pay for the damage done, there being fault or negligence, but there is no 
pre-existing contractual relation between the parties. So, walang pre-existing obligations between the two. Wala naman silang contract to each other. So, it was an act of, um, there was fault, there was negligence on the part of Mr. X, which caused damage to Mrs. A. Kasi, na-hospitalized si Mrs. A, she incurred physical injuries, and she also had an abortion. So, next is, Ms. can Mrs. A pursue a criminal case instead and still recover damages from Mr. X? So the answer here is yes, since the acts of Mr. X constituted reckless imprudence that led to the damages provided for in Article 1161, wherein it states that civil obligations arising from criminal offenses shall be governed by the penal laws, or RPC, and subject to the provisions of Article 2177 and the pertinent provisions of Chapter 2, Preliminary Titles on Human Relations, ito na yung So as in this case, since the acts of Mr. X was recklessly driving, causing damage to Mrs. E, uh, if proven criminally liable, he is also civilly liable as it is included in Article 100 of the RPC that every person who is criminally liable shall be also civilly liable. So, pwede nga rin siyang, um, pwede siya rin, kasu uh, pwede ka rin siyang kasuhan civilly under Article 1161. <laughs> so, suppose Mrs. A has decided to pursue the criminal case against Mr. X. during But during the pendency of the trial, Mr. X dies. So, what happens to the criminal case? So, pursuant to, the art to Article 89 of the Revised Penal Code, wherein it's cited how criminal liability is extinguished by Paragraph 1 thereof, stating nga na yung pecuniary liabilities may extinguish din siya pag namatay yung, ano, pag namatay yung offender during the pendency of the case. So, pen personal penalties are extinguished. As in this case, Mr. X dies, his criminal liability is extinguished. If may civil liabilities outside, he can recover damages from the heirs. So, ito na nga. What will happen to Mrs. A prayer for recovery of damages or the civil aspect of the case in, in the event that Mr. X death during pendency of the case. So rule one one one, I think rule one 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 of the um of the rules on criminal procedure, particularly section four, um speaks of the effects of the death on civil action. So the death of the accused after arraignment and during the pendency of the criminal action shall extinguish the civil liability arising from the delict. However, the the independent civil action instituted under section three of this rule, rule one 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 or which thereafter is instituted to enforce liability arising from other sources of obligation may be continued against the estate or legal representative of the accused after proper substitution or against said estate, as the case may be. The, the heirs of the accused may be substituted for the deceased without requiring the appointment of an executor or administrator, and the court may appoint a, gar a guardian for the minor heirs. Ayan, ayan na pala. I didn't press it. I'm sorry. So, suppose Mr. X is a, is a driver employee of Mr. O. Can Mrs. A pursue a case for damages directly against Mr. O instead of Mr. X? So, the answer here is yes, from quasi delict on the part of Mr. O as the employer of Mr. X, since these are acts or omissions which causes damage to another in his person, property, or rights, giving rise to an obligation to pay for the damage done um, there being fault or negligence, but there is no pre-existing contractual relation between the parties. As in this case, since the obligation rose from the negligent acts of Mr. X, Mrs. A may allege, um, may allege Article 103 of the Revised Penal Code, if you remember from Criminal Law 1, or subsid subsidiary liability if the guilt of Mr. X can be proven beyond reasonable doubt and he be also declared as insolvent. On the other hand, Mrs. A may also opt to allege Article 2176 for the failure of Mr. O to exercise due diligence in the selection and supervision of their employees. So, um, quasi delict speaks of two kinds. It's uh, culpa akilana and culpa contacta. So, the first one is yung nakita natin kanina, yung, kay, yung liability ni Mr. X. That's um, culpa Aquilana because um, walang pre-existing obligation between the two and it caused she, Mr. X caused damage to Mrs. A. While in culpa contractual, um, there is an existing obligation. So ito, yung part naman na to, si Mr. O tsaka si, si Mr. O being the, the employee of Mr. X has an obligation 
to Mrs. A and also Mr. X din. Pwede mong tawag, ita, yung tawag ato dun, um, contract of carriage that to safely, kung maria passenger niya pala si Mrs. A, to safely um, deliver Mrs. A to her destination. Actually, yung next question, we'll discuss this. So, ayan. <laughs> Instead of being a pedestrian crossing the street, Mrs. A was a passenger of the common carrier being driven by Mr. X and owned by Mr. O. The car met an accident, and as a result, Mrs. A suffered injury. What options are available to Mrs. A for recovery of damages? So, what I was discussing before I showed this slide, yun nga yung sinasabi ko, yung damages against Mr. O because of breach of contract of carriage against Mr. O. So, this is full pa contact under quasi the next one. Okay. So, we go now to this one. So, distinguish a generic thing from a determinate thing. So, this is in obligations to give. So, a generic or indeterminate thing is merely generated by its class uh, or genus without any designation or physical segregation from all others of the same class. So, for example, a Rolex watch, uh, a black Honda SUV, a German Shepherd dog. So, ito yung, ano siya, it's on its own genus. Class lang siya, pero marami. I mean, it's not irreplaceable, per se. So, on the other hand, a determinate thing is particularly designated or physically segregated from all the others of the same class. For example, a black Honda Civic, a black Honda Civic with plate number five uh, ABD 5174, or the watch um, Riley wore on his graduation day, or the house at the end of the house at the end of some Pagita Street in Pasig City. Or number 55 at the house of the end of the street of Pasig City. Yung very particular siya. So next is, what are the obligations of a debtor in an obligation to deliver a determinate thing? So ano yung mga kailangan gawin ng debtor? So there are a few. So first is to preserve the thing. This is under Article 1163. Kailangan i-preserve niya yung um, determinate thing na uh, kailangan niya ibigay kay creditor. So, deliver the fruits of the thing. Deliver the accessions and accessories. This is under 1166. Deliver the thing itself and answer for damages in case of non-fulfillment or breach under one, for Article 1170. So, the debtor likewise cannot substitute it with another, although the latter is of the same kind and quality without the consent of the creditor. So what are the remedies of the creditor in, in case na i-breach ni, um, ni debtor yung pag-deliver ng determinate thing? So the, dem the remedy of, or right, of, of right to demand specific performance or fulfillment, if possible, of the obligation with the right to indemnity for damages, demand rescission or cancellation, demand payment of that, or demand for, of payment of damages only. So ito, naka, nakalagay ito sa paragraph 1 of Article 1165, wherein the creditor may compel the debtor to make the delivery. So rescission is, it's going to be discussed in another video or in this video. I'm not sure. But it's more properly, um, in the Book of Balane, it's more properly stated as resolution, hindi rescission. But anyway, this the concept of rescission is to cancel the contract. And it is available in proper cases if, in a reciprocal obligation, one of the parties is guilty of breach. So, sa reciprocal obligations, right? And in addition, whether the creditor elects the remedy of performance or resolution, damages consistent with the remedy chosen are demandable by the creditor. So, pwede pa rin siyang mag-attach ng damages kung ano man yung pinin niya. So, what are the obligations of a debtor in an obligation to deliver a, a generic thing? So, kanina, a determinate thing. How about kung generic thing yung kailangan niya i-deliver. So, to deliver a thing which is of the quality intended by the parties, taking into consideration the purpose of the obligation and other circumstances and um, other circumstances and to be liable for damages in case of fraud, negligence, or delay in the performance of his obligation or the contravention of the tenor thereof. So, pwedeng, i, pwedeng sabihin ni, ni creditor na i-deliver yung thing ng parehas na quality or pag ayaw talaga ni ayaw talaga ni debtor pwedeng ipa pwedeng um, i-compensate to ni creditor at his expense 
So next is what are the remedies of a creditor in case of breach of an obligation to deliver a generic thing? So ito na, the second paragraph provides of Article 1165 still provides for the remedy which is to ask that the obligation be complied with on account of the debtor. So uh, sagot niya, mag mag may ibang magkocomply for the obligation pero sagot ni debtor. In addition, the creditor may also demand vicarious performance like delivery of a thing corresponding to the kind and quantity specified at the debtor's expense. This is also called substitute per performance. Uh, so, pwedeng magpa-deliver siya ng, since, uh, yung, since generic nga to, so it's not really a particular thing. So, pwedeng sabihin ni creditor na uh, mag-deliver na lang ng same kind or same quantity as specified, still at the expense of the debtor. So, the next question is, what are the remedies of a creditor in case of breach of an obligation to do? So the remedy and performance to do is provided for in Article 117. If a person obliged to do something fails to do it, the same shall be executed at his cost. Um, the same rule shall be observed if he, if he does it in controversion of the tenor of the obligation. Furthermore, it may be decreed that what has been poorly done be undone. So parang sa obligations din to give, um, may magko-comply din sa dun sa obligation pa rin matutupad pa rin yung obligation at the expense of the debtor. So yung remedies na sinasabi nila dito is if the debtor fails to comply the creditor has the right to have the obligation performed by himself pwedeng siya yung gumawa um, or another person unless personal considerations are involved at the debtor's expense and to recover damages if the obligation is done in controversion of the terms of the same is or is poorly done it may be ordered by the court na huwag ipaandan yung nagawa na. So, can uh, the creditor demand for a specific performance in an obligation to do? So, ito yung, kumbaga, pwede mo bang i-compel yung debtor mo na kung obligation to do man siya, na gawin yung kailangan niyang gawin? So, the answer here is, if it is possible to do the obligation, the creditor has the right to demand it. So, kung wari, uh, possible naman, mapapag-usapan nyo naman, um, pwede kung possible. Pero syempre, you ha nas may say din dito yung debtor, pero syempre, may right pa rin si creditor. However, the creditor cannot demand the debtor for specific performance. Hindi niya pwedeng i-demand to totally. Kasi this will amount to involuntary servitude, which is unlawful. It is against our constitution and the creditor may opt to file naman for resolution or damages. What are the remedies of a creditor in case of a breach of an obligation to do? Oh, not to do, rather. So Article 1186 uh, provides that when the obligation consists in not doing and the obliger does what has been forbidden him, it shall be undone at his expense. So this article is also known as a negative obligation of frustration that is not to do a certain thing or act. The, act, the thing done or act performed shall be undone at the, expect, the, at the expense of the obliger. So damages may be claimed against him. So we move on now to Article 1169, which provides for mora. So what is mora? So, mora or delay is the failure to perform an obligation on time, which failure constitutes a breach of the obligation. So, delay is synonymous to default or mora. Uh, it means that delay in the fulfillment of obligation. So, magiging at default, nila, magiging at default yung debtor. So, it's non-fulfillment with respect to time. Delay in positive obligations only. So, ando lang to, nag apply lang to sa... Uh, obligations to do and to give. So, walang delay or mora in negative obligations. Delay begins when the creditor demand the, per the performance of the obligation. So, merong kinds tayo ng mora. We have mora solvendi when the de default or the delay is on the debtor. Then, under this, we have x-ray or x-ray, it's on, it's on obligations to give. Then, x persona is obligations to do. Then, we have mora apicendi or the default on the creditor. So, yung, uh, yung, yung kailangan gawin ng creditor yung nag-incur the delay. Tapos, we have compensation more, or the delay on both parties in reciprocal obligation. So, walang, walang nag, walang, 
ano to, walang gumawa nung kailangan na gawin ng obligations and receipt of obligations. So we go now to the next problem. Ex address maker was contacted by Carla to make a gown to be delivered on February 14th, wow, Valentine's 2020. On the day X was supposed to deliver Carla's dress, X called up Carla to inform her that she, she had an urgent matter to attend to and will deliver them the next day. That night, however, a fire broke out from the nearby gas station and reached her shop. Everything was destroyed, including Carla's dress. X claims that she is not liable to deliver Carla's dress or to pay for the clothing materials consistent considering she herself was a victim of a fortuitous event and over which she had no control. Do you agree? So, yung sagot talaga dito, um, yes, we agree. Because it is a general rule, wait, it is a general rule that delay by the debtor begins only from the moment a ju uh, demand, judicial or extrajudicially, was made um, and for the fulfillment of the former's obligation, so yung creditor kailangan mag-demand siya bago magkaroon na mag-demand siya judicially or extrajudicially before mag maging at default yung debtor niya. So in this case, since there is no since there has been no demand made by Carla, excess obligation should be extinguished because of the fortuitous event following the rule in um, Article 1174. Na in case of fortuitous event, may extinguish yung obligations ng um, pag nawala yung determinate thing. So, does fortuitous event um, apply in indeterminate or generic um, prestations or things? So, it doesn't apply. Kasi nga, genus, it's on, they have their own genus na um, it's a determinate thing. So, pwede siyang palitan. So, hindi, hindi mag-a-apply yung pag-extinguish ng obligation through for two with those events sa mga sa indeterminate na thing. So when does an obliger who is bound to deliver to do something in current delay? So pursuant to Article 1169 of the Civil Code wherein it provides that the obliger in current delay from the time the obligee judicially or extrajudicially demands from them the fulfillment of their obligations. So we go now to the next example. Moonwalk obtained a loan from SSS. In the loan agreement, um, Moonwalk obliged himself to pay the monthly installments on the loan every fifth of the month. There is likewise a penalty clause where SSS is allowed to impose interest of 1% on the amount due per month per month of delay. Pag na delay, may 1% interest down. So Moonwalk paid to, failed to pay every fifth of the month for the past five years. SSS then demanded payment of the accrued unpaid installments plus interest of 1% per month for five years. Moonwalk refused to pay the interest, arguing that it is not guilty of delay. SSS countered that the contract provided for a specific date when monthly payments must be made, hence non-payment um, non -payment on the agreed date automatically constitutes delay. If you were the judge, how will you decide in this case? So if I were the judge, I will rule in favor of SSS because even though it is a general rule that delayed the delay by the debtor begins only from the moment a demand, judicial or extrajudicial, for the fulfillment of the former's obligation is made by the creditor. May exceptions, Jan. So, isa sa exceptions to, which is when the obligation so provides. As seen here, na sinabi naman na um, yung pag hindi sila nakapagbay, pag hindi sila, that they will impose a 1% on the amount due per month of delay. So, may na, na expressly stipulated siya dito sa agreement nila. So, therefore, the accrued interest is demandable as the obligation so provided that delay of payment imposes 1% interest and shall be moonwalk in default. When does delay, in, when does delay start in reciprocal obligations? So, this is still in Article 1169. It's the fourth paragraph. So, in reciprocal obligations, neither party incurs in delay if the other does not comply or is not ready to comply in a proper manner that what with what is incumbent upon him. From the moment one of the parties fulfills his obligation, delay by the other begins. In this effect of the delay, the delay of the obliger cancels the delay of the obligee and vice versa. So, wala pang gumagalaw sa kanila. Pero the moment na pag yung isa nag-comply na sa obligation niya, Kasi diba, yung reciprocal obligations, sabay sila. Kasi parang contract of sale. So, when you pay, you get the item. So, kung yung isa doon, ready to pay na, 
Tapos, lampas na dun sa date na napag-usapan nila, may delay na dun sa other party. So, to give you an example and to better understand their reciprocal obligations, um, so here, Bobby and Red entered into a contract of sale where Bobby, a seller, will deliver his iPhone 5 to buyer Red, who in turn must pay the purchase price. When will either party incur in delay if they agreed to consummate the sale on February 15, 2021, but to date, no one has performed their respective obligations. So, pursuant to Article 1169, Paragraph 4, kagaya nga nang sinabi natin sa kanina, kanina reciprocal obligations, walang nag-incur into delay if the other party does not comply or is not ready um, or is not ready to comply in a proper manner with what is incumbent upon him. So, from the moment one of the parties fulfills his obligation, delay by the other begins. So, in this case, the moment Bobby delivers the iPhone 5 to Red, delay by Red in terms of the payment begins. On the other hand, the moment Red pays Bobby for the iPhone 5, delay on the part of Bobby in delivering the iPhone 5 to Red begins. Is there a need for Red to make a demand for Bobby uh, to Bobby for the delivery of the iPhone 5 in case he is now ready to pay the purchase price? Or would a mere communication to Bobby about his readiness to comply with the obligations of uh, suffice? So, as stated kanina, yung generally nga, yung delay by the debtor begins only from the moment that demand, judicial or extrajudicial, for the fulfillment of the former's obligation is made by the creditor. And in reciprocal obligations nga, pag ready na nga yung isa, di ba? But as in this case, um, mere reminder would not suffice to ask Bobby for compliance since this shall only be done after court proceedings and a judicial notice directs such. In the case at bar, wherein Red is intending to pay the price, therefore, it is incumbent upon him to demand for the iPhone 5 from Bobby in return for his for his payment to be made. So another is Bobby and Red and entered into a contract of sale, where Bobby as a seller will deliver his iPhone 5 to Red, still the same example, who in turn must pay the purchase price 15 days from the receipt of the iPhone 5. So, suppose Bobby delivered the iPhone 5 to Red last February 12, 2021. To date, however, Red has not yet um, delivered the purchase price to Bobby. So, is Red guilty of delay? So, no. In this case, wherein performance is set on different dates, a demand by Bobby on February 12 or subsequently is needed to put Red in delay. Since hindi naman to, um, it doesn't fall under that, the provision or the exception. So distinguish moral solvendi ex persona from moral solvendi ex ray. Ito yung sinasabi natin kinds of moral a while ago. So yung moral solvendi, it's the delay of the debtor. Remember? So moral solvendi ex persona is the general rule wherein demand is necessary to constitute the debtor in um to constitute the debtor in delay. While moral solvendi ex ray is the exception to the rule in the three instances cited in paragraph two of Article 1169, yun na nga yung sinabi natin kanina, yung pag, um, the, pag, when the obligation expressly so dictates when, um, when it's time, when time is of the essence, when, um, when it will be useless to make the demand, and also included is in the reciprocal obligations. So, non-performance on the due date automatically gives rise to mora. So this is another example. A day before the wedding, still unsure if Trisha could deliver the gown, Zenny went to the Besoria and bought herself a cheap, ready-to-wear bridal gown. Two days after the wedding, Trisha delivered the bridal gown. Zenny rejected the delivery and sued Trisha for damages. Trisha, on the other hand, argued that she cannot be considered guilty of delay since there is no demand. If you were the judge, how will you rule? So dito sa case na to, si Trisha, liable siya. For damages, kasi generally nga, sinabi natin kanina, yung tatlong exception, isa dun, is yung time of, time is of the essence. So, general, yung general rule, we go back to that, na um, judicial, kailangan may, yung demand, may judicial or extrajudicial for the fulfillment of the former's obligation. Pero nga, pasok to sa tatlong exceptions, dun sa tatlong exemptions, yung isa dun, is when time of, is of the essence. In, the, in these kinds of agreements, time element is as important as the performance itself. Kasi nga, ikakasal siya eh. So, so din niya yung for the wedding. Ano nga namang gagawin niya dun sa wedding gown two days after her wedding? 
So Trisha is fully aware in this case that the performance of her obligation to deliver the gown after the wedding would no longer benefit Zenny, which makes her liable even absent the demand from Zenny, as it, it was not necessary for the agreement to categora to categorically um, state that time is of the essence in delivering the bridal gown since yung intent na kitang kita naman na nasa kasal nga gagamitin siya pa yung bride makakaloka naman to anyway we go now next to article 1173 define negligence on, under article 1173 so article 1173 provides that fault or negligence of the obliger consists in the omission of diligence which is required by the nature of the obligation and corresponds with the circumstances of the person of the time and of the place. When negligence shows bad faith, the provisions of Articles 1171 and 2201, Paragraph 2, shall apply. Wait. So we go now to the next one. So if the law or contract does not state the degree of diligence, what degree of diligence should be should the debtor observe in the performance of the obligation? So if the law or contract does not state the diligence which is observed in the performance that which is ex that which is expected of a good father of a family shall be required. This concept involves giving the care which the nature of the thing cared for demands. So next is, um, so distinguish fraud from negligence. Okay, so this is the case of Legaspi Oil Co. versus Corporation versus Court of Appeals. So here, fraud was defined as voluntary execution of a wrongful act or a willful omission, knowing and intending the effects of which naturally and necessarily arise from such act or omission. In the civil code, it is the deliberate and intentional evasion of the normal fulfillment of the obligation. On the other hand, negligence lacks deliberate, and, uh, deliberate intent. So, as we know nga in our criminal law, yung fraud uh, is mala in sa crime. While yung mga crimes naman that's arising from ne negligence, uh, wala, it lacks intent. So, to give you an example, Anita, owner of a sari, sari store, bought from Nilo, a rice trader, five sacks of dinner at the rice. They entered into a written contract where the, where the buyer expressly waived any action against the seller for the breach of an obligation. In order to get more profits, Nilo delivered to Anita NFA rice, but he packaged them using sacks for dinner at the rice. Anita then sold the rice to her customers and she later received several complaints. What remedy or remedies are available to Anita? So Anita may bring an action against Nilo for damages arising from fraud because a waiver of an action for future fraud um, as done by the contract is void as being against the law and public policy also pursuant to Article 1171 of the Civil Code. So yung sinasabi na sa contract nila in, uh, expressly, waived, um, expressly waived action against the seller for breach of an obligation, hindi daw valid yun. Kasi it goes against, um, it goes against our laws. It, it is against public policy. And pursuant then to Article 117, one of the Civil Code, it is uh, prohibited. So next is, sorry typo, can Nilo invoke Anita's waiver in the written contract to avoid liability? So as I said late, a while ago, no nga. Kasi as stated in the previous number, since Article 1171 expressly provides that a waiver of action, of an action for future fraud, shall be void in this case, wherein the contract stipulated that any action, uh, any action in case of breach will with Nilo committed. Which Nilo? actually committed. So distinguish mora from negligence and fraud. So distinguish from the first two causes um, causes for culpable irregularity, which is fraud and negligence, which consists in the irregularity of the uh, of the quality or the manner. Delay consists in irregularity as to time. So mora is the non-fulfillment with respect to time. While yung fraud naman, saka yung negligence, it's the manner or the quality na parang yun yung nagiging causes ng, ng pag ano nila, ng pag non-fulfill nila sa obligation nila. So what are the two remedial options available to an aggrieved creditor in case of the debtor's fault? So ano daw yung pwedeng gawin ng aggrieved creditor? 
So the aggrieved creditor may demand either of the remedy, uh, either the remedy or of performance of resolution with the right to damage. Just the things we said in recession, which will be discussed in a later um, article. So in an obligation to do, which is not really personal, the obligee should the oblig obliger refuse to perform may de may demand that the prestation be performed at the, the obliger's expense. And an obligation to do which is purely personal, like something only an obliger can perform, the obliger can remedy in this case the obliger's refusal in damages. Kasi nga, di ba, hindi mo nga siya pwedeng pilitin na gawin yung, hindi niya, uh, yung gawin yung obligation to do. Kasi nga, it's invo it, um, it, it amounts to involuntary servitude. So pwede ka na lang mag-ask mag for damages. So what is a fortuitous event? So this is under Article 1174. A fortuitous event is an event which cannot be foreseen or which, though foreseen, is inevitable. Stated otherwise, it is an event which is either impossible to, uh, to foresee or impossible to avoid. So ito yung mga parang earthquake, um, baha, ganyan, or pwede rin naman siyang um, man-made, like robbery, ganyan, or may accident. But, but it depends, ha? Hindi, hindi counted yung accident ng um, all the time na parang fortuitous event. Kasi may nabasa akong case na um, ang daming pile of cases ng Supreme Court na sinasabi nila yung flat tire or I think yung pumutok na tire, they were saying na it should be counted as fortuitous event kaya nagkaka-accident or kaya nagkaka-damage, kung wari, yung mga ganun. Pero sin parang sinabi at the end of it na sinabi ng Supreme Court, yung mga tires na ganun, it will not be counted as fortuitous event. Just a trivia. So explain why fortuitous event is considered an ex exculpatory cause. So fortuitous events are exculpatory causes because as a rule, a person is not responsible for loss or damage caused to another resulting from the non-performance of his obligations due to, to due to a fortuitous event. In other words, his obligation is extinguished. Kasi nga naman, sino bang, um, sino bang makakapigil ng earthquake, for example? So give the four requisites of fortuitous events. So the requisites include the event must be independent of the human will or at least of the debtor's will. The event could not be foreseen or if foreseen, inevitable. The event must be of such a character as to render it impossible for the debtor to comply with his obligation in a normal manner. And the debtor must be free from any, of, any participation in or the aggravation of the inquiry to the creditor. That is, there is no concurrent negligence on his part. So the receipt by the creditor of payment for principal, for principal without reservation to unpaid interest give, gives rise to what presumption. So this is under Article 1176 now. So pursuant to Article 1176, the receipt by the creditor of the payment for principal without reservation to unpaid interest gives rise, that the, gives rise to the presumption that the said interest has been paid. So pag walang sinasabi dun sa stipulation na um, walang reservation dun sa unpaid interest, pinarepresume na nabayaran na rin yun. So another is the receipt by the creditor of a payment for later installments without reservation to prior installments gives rise to what particular presumption. So ito naman, so kung mara installments, tapos kung mara magbabayad ka dyan monthly, di ba? For example, for this year, ano na bang yun? April. So, uh, sabihin natin, I said I declared na I paid for eight, um for the months of March and April. So, pag walang reserv without reservation here, um the presumption is I already paid for the months of January and February. It gives rise to the presumption of the prior installments being paid pursuant to paragraph 2 of Article 1176 unless proven otherwise. Ayan na nga. So what are the four remedies by which the creditor may pursue the debtor's property for the purpose of enforcing obligations? So pag, ano na, pag hahabulin mo na yung mga properties ng debtor mo kasi wala na nga talaga siyang, uh, wala ka na makuha sa kanya. So the remedies available would be one, to exact fulfillment with the right to damages, two, to pursue the le leviable um, property of the debtor, three, after having pursued their property and possession, exercise all the rights, uh, being being all the actions of the debtor except those interest in in or personal to the latter, 
and ask the court to rescind or impun acts or contracts which the debtor may have done to defraud him when he cannot in any other manner recover his claim. So, may mga tawag din sa mga yan. So, what is action subra- subrogatoria and action poliana? So, action subrogatoria, once the creditor has exhausted the property of the debtor, he can step into the shoes of the debtor and sue the debtor's debtor. So, kumari si A, may si A yung, si, yung creditor, tapos si si B yung debtor. Si B, may debtor, si C. So, pwede nang si A mag-act na in shoes of B para singilin si C on behalf of B. Gets ba? So, this allows creditors to set aside transfers of property uh, by their creditor. Uh, oh, sorry. Allows creditors to set aside transfers of property by their debtors which defraud them by preventing them from obtaining full satisfaction of their credits. Ito namang sinasabi kong to. Ito naman yung action po yan. It's actually uh, um, a last resort kind of thing. So, this is when the creditors to set aside the transfers of property um, by their debtors which defrauding them by preventing them from obtaining full satisfaction. Yun na nga. Parang ipreprevent mo na silang galawin yung property po nila. Sorry. Ayan. To give you a clear um clear definition of what I said if nalaguan kayo dun sa pag-explain ko. Yes. Action po yan. Creditors to set aside. So, can the creditor pursue those actions simultaneously? So, the answer here is no. The first and immediate would be resort to action directa. If this is, this do not, yung, I'll discuss later what action directa is. So, if this does not suffice, then action subrogatoria. Yung kanina nga yung step into the debtors. debtors. Tapos, uh, the last remedy, as I said, last resort, yung action poliana. So, what is action directa? So, action directa is the most immediate object of the debtor's remedy of compliance wherein he may exhaust the existing properties of the debtor subject to the exceptions provided by the law. So, I think, ano ba naalala ko? Yung mga exceptions dito, yung parang inaalala sa PFR, yung family home, kasi hindi yun pwedeng i, ano, hindi yun pwedeng i exhaust ng creditor kasi isa yun sa parang nakalagay sa article 115 ay 155 rather na hindi pwedeng hindi pwedeng tong kunin ng creditor yung kung ano to kung pasok siya as a family home so ayun so pwede mo lang ang pwede mo nang isu yung debtor mo in order to get your get what is due to you so how does action directed the from action subrogatoria. So in action directa, the creditor exhausts the property possessed by the debtor to enforce the obligation while in action subrogatoria. The um, properties in the in the former does not suffice for the obligation. Hence, the creditor is given the right to act on his, on his debtor's behalf. In short, the debtor's debtor is now the creditor's debtor. So yun na so to give you an example, debtor X approached you. He has an outstanding, outstanding rather, indebtedness to Y, secured by a mortgage on his house. He is asking for legal advice if his son Z would be liable for said obligations in the event that he dies and his son dies. And son, sorry, his son acquires the house over which the mortgage has been constituted. What will be your advice? So, sasabihin natin dito na si Z may be liable for the obligation at, as it is provided in Article 1178 that rights acquired in virtue of an obligation are transmissible if there has been no stipula- stipulation to the contrary and as in this case, there is no stipulation to prove that Z must not be liable. So, nabapasa yung obligation kung, walang stip- kung hindi nakalagay sa stipulation na hindi ito maipapasa. So, naipapasa yung mga obligations. So, now, Z can be liable in behalf of his father. So, what are the exceptions to the rule on transmiss- transmissibility of obligations? So, yung exceptions dito are when it is prohibited by law, like rights in partnership, agency, and comodatum, and when it is prohibited uh, by the stipulation of the parties. So, rights are transmissible nga unless the rights are personal.